Hi guys, good morning. I hope you're doing great. Um, my name is Shante Holiday, and today I just wanted to invite you to work out with me. Um, if you hear that voice in the background, it's because I'm listening to Think and Go Grow Rich while I work out. But if you want to work out with me and listen to anything else, of course, you are welcome to turn up as you choose. This is basically just the only way I'm able to actually consume my book. So. Yeah, I'm basically making all of you my accountability partners in regards to this workout. We're just gonna get it done, okay? So, yeah, I'm gonna get ready, and then we can get started. And the goal is for me to work out at least 30 minutes before my little one gets up. Chapter 2. Thoughts are things. The man who oh, fought man. his way into partnership, Thomas A. Edison. My Two son changed the resistance on his bike, so it's usually at like five, and he had put it at eight, so I can leave my life real quick. Burning desire for their translation into riches or other <laughs> material objects. Some years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it Hello, is that you really can think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about in one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire. Let me know if you guys are working or relaxing today down in the comments. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. Hi, good morning. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Pay close attention to the story of how he turned his desire into reality, and you'll have a better understanding of the principles that lead to riches. When this desire, or this thought, first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two problems stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to buy a train ticket to West Orange, New Jersey, where the famed Edison Laboratory was located. These problems would have discouraged the majority of people from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. and the tramp. Edwin C. Barnes presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced that he had come to go into business with the inventor. Years later, in speaking about that first meeting, Mr. Edison said about Barnes, he stood there before me. Hi, you guys. Good morning. How are you? But there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he'd come after. So this I is actually the first morning where I'm using a, a different app on um, Step Theory to be live on Facebook and YouTube at the same time and stuff. So if you would like to work out with me on YouTube and then put it up on the fire stick, you can actually do that too um, if it's easier for you. <clears throat> Could not have been the young man's appearance that got him his start in the Edison office. That was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. What he did get was a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage. Months went by. Nothing happened to bring nearer the goal that Barnes had set as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said, when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison, and he was determined to remain ready until he got what he was seeking. He did not say to himself, oh, well, what's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a salesman's job. But he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison, and I'll accomplish my goal if it takes the remaining Hi, guys. Good morning. Thank you for joining me this morning. What a different story people would tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination and his persistence in focusing on a single desire was destined to mow down all opposition and bring in the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form and 
from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many people fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new device, but at that time as the Edison dictating machine. His salesmen were not enthusiastic about the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer-looking machine that interested no one but Barnes. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison dictating machine, and he told Edison so. Edison decided to give him his chance, and Barnes did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association, Barnes made himself rich in money, but he did something infinitely greater. He proved that you really can think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes was worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it brought him two or three million dollars. Editor's comment. Three million dollars in the early years of the 20th century would be comparable to more than 50 million dollars in terms of buying power at the beginning of the 21st century. This is the end of the editor's comment. But the amount becomes insignificant compared with the greater asset he acquired. The definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into material rewards by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with Great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except knowing what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized Good morning, you guys. Thank you for joining me. Three feet from gold. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when you are overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. During the gold rush days, an uncle of my friend, R.U. Darby, was caught by gold fever, and he went west to Colorado to dig and grow rich. He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the thoughts of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine and returned to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland. He told his relatives and a few neighbors about the strike. They got together the money for the machinery and had it shipped. R.U. Darby decided to join his uncle and then went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear their debts. Then would come the big killing in profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and Uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. The junk man called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculation showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. And that is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Never forgetting that he lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited by the experience in his newly chosen field. He simply said to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, 
but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby became one of a small group of men who sell over a million dollars of life insurance annually. He owed his stickability to the lesson he learned from his credibility in the gold mining business. Before success comes in anyone's life, that person is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and perhaps some failure. When defeat overtakes a person, the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of people do. More than 500 of the most successful people this country has ever known told me their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping you just when success is almost within reach. Hi, you guys. Good editor's comments. Thank you for your support and good vibes. I appreciate it. I see the reaction. Success was an inspiration <laughs> for entrepreneur and motivational speaker Wayne Allen Rubin to write his book, The Joy of Failure. Published in the late 1990s, it not only tells Wayne's personal story of using his failures as stepping stones to success, he also recounts stories from other successful people, which prove that the rich and famous got to be that way only because of what they learned from their failures. People such as Jack Welch, the hugely successful CEO of General Electric, who early in his career failed dramatically when a plastics plant for which he was responsible blew up. Billionaire Charles Schwab was a failure at school and university, flunking basic English twice due to a learning disability, and then failed on Wall yeah. Street more than once before he If you are working out with me, just feel free to let me know. Rich indeed. Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Clinton, Stephen Jobs, Donald Trump, and a host of other equally well known achievers all had to fail in order to learn the lessons that ultimately made them successes. Every one of them was a failure, but none of them was defeated. Charles F. Kettering, who patented more than 200 inventions, including the automobile ignition, the spark plug, Freon for air conditioners, and the automatic transmission, said, From the time a person is six years old until he graduates from college, he has to take three or four examinations a year. If he flunks once, is out. But an inventor is almost always failing. He tries and fails maybe a thousand times. If he succeeds once, then he's in. These two things are diametrically opposite. We often say that the biggest job we have is to teach a newly hired employee how to fail intelligently. We have to train him to experiment over and over and to keep on trying and failing until he learns what will work. Failures are just practice shots. This is the end of the editor's comment. A 50 cent lesson in persistence. Shortly after Mr. Darby received his degree from the University of Hard Knocks, he witnessed something that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean no. One afternoon, he was helping his uncle grind wheat in an old fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on which a number of sharecroppers Good morning, lived. you guys. How you doing? Quietly, the door was opened, and a small child, the daughter of a tenant, walked in. I always have to remind myself door. to fix my posture when I work out. So I want to slouch so bad. What do you want? <laughs> Meekly, the child replied, My mom says to send her 50 cents. I'll not do it, the uncle retorted. Now you run on home. But she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work, not noticing that she did not leave. When he looked up again and saw her still standing there, he said, I told you to go on home. Now go, or I'll take a switch to you. But she did not budge. The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the middle hopper and started toward the child. Darby held his breath. He knew his uncle had a fierce temper. When the uncle reached the spot okay. where the child was standing, she quickly stepped forward one step. This is about 13 minutes. And screamed I really want to get to 15 voice. minutes. My I haven't worked out in a while. So as long as I can just push for this extra two minutes, then I'll be good. Okay. 
Yeah. And I'll be able to just build up my time back up to like 30, 44 of my minutes an hour kind of thing. Never take um, off yeah. She just burning anymore so i want to see how much more i can kind of push out before i feel like i have to stop <laughs> plus my little one isn't up yet so we're gonna make this the situation <laughs> Thank you. 
consideration the popular belief that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. What you need to know now is how to acquire the state of mind that will attract riches. I spent 25 years researching the answer to that question because I, too, wanted to know how wealthy men become that way. What you will learn is that as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy and begin to apply those principles, your financial status will begin to improve. Everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. One of the main weaknesses the average person suffers is too much familiarity with the word impossible. We know all the rules that will not work. We know all the things that cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules that have made others successful and are willing to take everything on those rules. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes right. to those who allow themselves to become failure conscious. Okay, you guys. That is the end of my workout for this morning. If you worked out with me or if you just tuned in for a second to say hello, I really, really appreciate you. I had a great time. Um, if you were here earlier than you already know and stuff there, I said 30 minutes originally. Then my legs started burning and I was like, okay, if I can just get to four, 15 minutes, just 15 minutes, I'll be happy. And now look at us. We're at 20 minutes and five seconds. I'm going to clean the whole victory, including the five seconds. So, yay. I'm excited. So what I'm going to do now is I've been listening to Think and Grow Rich for anyone who does not know. Um, and so I'm going to hop off the bike and I'm going to get my notebook and I like to read and take notes at the same time to make sure that I'm actually really like absorbing all of it. And then I like to kind of go back and actually study my notes from the book reading itself to me and stuff and then repeat it a couple of times as needed. A few of the books that I've read and stuff there, I have had to go back and really absorb it a few times. So yeah, but um, I hope you guys are having an amazing Saturday morning and I hope you have a great weekend. I will totally talk to you later. Bye you guys.